little slow on the uptake. If you can just step back, if you would, one slide, that would be great. So imagine you begin with equal numbers of rabbits and anti-rabbits. So in the animation that you get, we got two of them. They pass through the black box, and we have now more rabbits and more anti-rabbits. That means that we're allowing the numbers of these particles, or in this case, these rabbits, to change. If you can't change the number of protons or antiprotons, then you're dead. Because if you start with equal numbers and they can't change, they're always going to be equal numbers. But if they change in the way illustrated here, you still have symmetry. You still have the same number of orange rabbits as blue rabbits. So you don't have the imbalance that Hitoshi was talking to. So if we look at the next criterion, we want to now start with the two rabbits and two anti-rabbits, but we want them to pass through the black box in such a way that the number of rabbits differs from the number of anti-rabbits. If we could do that, then we'd have the imbalance that Hitoshi was talking about, and that gives us a chance of explaining why there's matter left over, the extra orange rabbits, the extra rabbits as opposed to anti-rabbits. Now, let me, put this in, let me just quickly show it in, in the language of particle physics. So imagine we have equal numbers, let's call it X. Matter and antimatter would pass through the black box and somehow yield that kind of imbalance. That is the goal of the black box. And what theorists have been trying to do for a very long time is fill in the details of the black box to try to come up with a mechanism that will allow that to happen. And clearly, one of the things that needs to happen is there has to be some kind of asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And that takes us, but Hitoshi had a comment, I want to get to that first, but then we'll talk about some of the experimental work that's been trying to find differences between matter and antimatter that might allow us to realize the black box. But it's well, a little comment I want to make was I was happy that you didn't use anti-human for this. Yes. You used I, the rabbits. I, I appreciate that. I thought about humans first, yeah. but then um, in the <laughs> political you. climate, it would be an obvious choice. <laughs> there was a choice of color, though, that subconsciously <laughs> aligned with that decision. Okay, anyway, so moving on. So, so, Michael, you've certainly been spending part of your career trying to find differences between matter and antimatter. I know you've done a variety of experiments. Can you just sort of run yes. through some of the possibilities? Exactly. So basically what you're trying to do is look for a tiny imbalance. You're trying to see a tiny difference between matter and antimatter. And by tiny, it's a part in a billion, a part in a trillion. Who knows how small this difference can be? And so if you're trying to measure this kind of difference with charged particles, you can do that. I mean, one of the experiments, the, the base experiment, for example, at CERN, is doing that by measuring the properties of antiprotons as they move around inside a magnetic field. But at some point, you're going to hit some limit, the systematic limit. You can't measure your magnetic field that precisely. So the ultimate precision that you can try to reach is not with working with charged particles, but actually working with neutral antimatter, neutral systems like atoms. And atoms are really great because there you can use lasers to probe the atoms. You can measure extremely precisely. So there's been an experiment, the Alpha experiment has been measuring the light that's emitted by anti-hydrogen atoms. Anti-hydrogen. Anti-hydrogen. So what is it? So how would you build anti-hydrogen? So what is it? You put two bits together. It's it's really simple. You take an anti-proton, take an anti-electron, you put them together. Um, you're a theorist, right? So that, that should be enough. That's about enough. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is boring details. Uh, it's, it's taken... Well, 10 years of hard work to make atoms. In no, that's what we're looking at right here. That's what the atom looks like, symbolically speaking. One of the first experiments to build the anti-hydrogen atom was the Athena experiment in 2002. It took almost 10 years before, between making the first atom and actually being able to hang on to it, to trap it. Because once you made it, it's neutral. Your electric field, your magnetic fields are useless. It just goes off. Oh, it's I see. Like for the, uh, for the anti-proton, you can exactly. pin it with the electric field. So you pin right. it with, with magnetic fields. You electric, hold it. Yeah. Very, very strong fields. It's very hard to hold on to these atoms. But the Alpha experiment managed to do that in 2010. And since then, they've been shooting everything they've got at these atoms. Laser light, microwave, anything you can do to, to manipulate these atoms and measure their properties. So you're trying to basically hit it with a laser, excite it, exactly. get that anti-electron 